Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionitis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our biochemistry playlist. In the last video, we talked about DNA and RNA. We talked about the difference between ribose and deoxyribose sugar, the difference between nucleosides and nucleotides, and we discussed the function of the most famous nucleotide, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which is a great source of energy for your body. Today, it's time to talk about purines and pyrimidines. Remember that purines have uh, two rings, but pyrimidines have one ring. Look at the structure. How many rings? Here is one, here is two. That's a purine. Please watch the videos in this biochemistry playlist in order, especially the last one about DNA. Remember that your genetic code is analogous to the computer code. There is hardware, those are the molecules. Now we're talking DNA, RNA, nucleoside, nucleotides, etc. And there is software. That's the code. For instance, the sequences of nucleotides on your DNA will determine the codon. And the codon will determine what kind of amino acid would I put. And the amino acid will determine what kind of protein will be secreted. Just like in the computer code, 1001 in the computer code is not the same as 1100, even though both have two ones and two zeros. But the arrangement is different, the information is different, and therefore the result is different. Where is your DNA? It's in your nucleus, for the most part. Some DNA exists in the mitochondria, and some exist in chloroplast of plants. You shall never forget the central dogma of the genetic code. DNA to RNA, transcription. RNA to proteins is translation. Translation is synonymous with protein synthesis. The first step happens in the nucleus, the second step in the cytoplasm. Inside your nucleus, you have your DNA, but your DNA is very long and your nucleus is very tiny. It's a microscopic structure. How come something so long can fit into the nucleus? Well, let's wrap it and wind it many times. Who do you wrap it around? I wrap it around histones. Histones are nucleoproteins, proteins in the nucleus, proteins related to the nucleic acid, which is your DNA. And I've told you that DNA and histones together are known as nucleosome. Which specific histone proteins are part of the nucleosome H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. How about H1? H1 has a function, but it's not part of the nucleosome, i.e. your DNA does not wrap around H1. What does H1 do? It seals the DNA in place, providing stability to the structure. And this sealing happens as the DNA enters or exits the nucleosome. I remember everything I need to know about H1 histone, by remembering the S mnemonic. H1 is solo. It loves solitude. It is not part of the pack. It is not part of H2A, H2B, H3, or H4. It is not part of the nucleosome. H1 is solo, acts in solitude. What does it do? Seals my DNA as it enters or exits the nucleosome, providing stability to the structure. And you keep wrapping your DNA, wrapping and winding your DNA. Before you know it, you end up with chromosomes. When your DNA is relaxed like this, it's called euchromatin. You means true, because this type of chromatin is relaxed and truly accessible. Therefore, you can act upon it. You can work with it, transcription and then translation, etc. And because it's relaxed, it appears lighter on microscopy. Conversely, this tightly packed DNA is called heterochromatin. Hetero means different, different from the U. It is condensed, not relaxed. It is inaccessible, which means transcriptionally silent and inactive. And therefore, it appears darker on microscopy. Which histones are part of the nucleosome? H2A, H2B, H3, H4. H, of course, stands for histone. And your DNA is a double helix most likely right-handed double helix. What's a gene? A gene is a piece of your DNA. DNA, sugar, phosphate group, nitrogenous bases. What kind of sugar? Deoxyribose. What kind of bases? Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. Adenine and guanine are purines. Thymine and cytosine are pyrimidines. A binds with T via two hydrogen bonds. C binds with G via 
three hydrogen bonds, i.e. more stable. What's the name of this bond, this bond, this? These are covalent bonds. Your body is made of systems. Each system has organs. Each organ has tissue. Each tissue is made of cells. The cell is the building unit. The cell has a nucleus. The nucleus contains 46 chromosomes. That's your genetic material. Somatic cells have 46 chromosomes. We call this 2N. But gametes or sex cells like ova, sperms, contain half of that. Only 23 chromosomes, which means just N for each. DNA is sugar, nitrogenous bases, and phosphate. Let's say we want to cook a meal. What's the end result? What's the meal? Protein is the meal. Where do I find the recipe written? The recipe is written on paper DNA. DNA or the nucleic acid, sugar, nitrogenous base, phosphate. What kind of sugar? In DNA, it's deoxyribose, but in RNA, it is ribose. Nitrogenous bases include adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. But in RNA, instead of saying thymine, we say uracil. Purines include adenine and guanine, and they have double rings. Thymine and cytosine are pyrimidine, and they have a singular ring. Sugar plus base equals nucleoside. Sugar plus base plus phosphate equals nucleotide. Mnemonic, nucleotide has phosphate. Nucleotide is the trio the three things. Here is the sugar of RNA. It's a ribose. Look at that. Ribose sugar, OH here and OH here. But look at the deoxyribose in DNA. So DNA, deoxyribose. Deoxy, no oxygen. I am missing one oxygen at carbon number two prime. O2 at carbon number two. If you find the O, it's a ribose, which means RNA. If you did not find the O, where is the O? The moment you ask this question, it's a deoxyribose and we're talking about DNA. There is another difference between DNA and RNA. DNA is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. Viruses offer exceptions, but that's a story for another time. A third difference between DNA and RNA, DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil. Both thymine and uracil are pyrimidines. Here is a ribose sugar. Here is an adenine base. Together they form adenosine, which is a nucleoside. What's the name of this lovely bond between the sugar and the base? It's a covalent bond between the ninth position on the base and uh, C1 prime on the sugar. We refer to the sugar by a number and prime. Hashtag prime sugar. The different combinations possible were discussed in the previous video. Let's make a nucleotide. So you need a trio, a triad of ribose sugar, adenine base, and phosphate. If you add one phosphate, we'll call it adenosine monophosphate. That's a nucleotide. If you add two phosphates, now it's called adenosine diphosphate. That's also a nucleotide. If you had a third phosphate group, you will get adenosine triphosphate, also a nucleotide. As we've said before, the phosphate is at the five prime end of the sugar. It carries negative charges and phosphate is full of energy. Why full of energy? Because we have repulsion forces between the negatives. That's why the second and third bonds are high energy, but the first one is ordinary energy. Because the second and third are between two negatives, but the first is not. And that's why there is more energy in ATP than ADP than AMP. How do you release the energy? Break down the ATP. Who's gonna do this? ATP. And when you break down the bond, you release energy. And this is weird, because normally bond breaking is endothermic. But ATP breaking is exothermic, i.e. releases energy. DNA is written and read from 5' prime to 3', prime, from the phosphate at 5' prime to the OH at the 3'. Prime. It's replicated from 5 to 3. It is transcripted from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Let's talk more about these bases. They are either purines or pyrimidines. Purines have two rings, and they include adenine and guanine. Pyrimidines, only one ring. The mnemonic that I use is, pyrimidines are like a pyramid. How many bases does a pyramid have? Answer, the pyramid only has one base, one ring. The base could be square, could be triangular, no one cares, but it's still one base. So thymine or cytosine and an RNA uracil have only one ring. 
but the purines adenine and guanine each one has two rings the mnemonic is pure as gold but for pyrimidines the mnemonic is cut the pyramid look at this lovely adenine it has carbon it has hydrogen it has nitrogen when you are a ring structure that possesses more than one element what should we call you we should call you heterocycle hetero means different because we have different elements cycle because we have rings here is guanine it has oxygen here here is thymine it has two oxygens and it has a methyl here cytosine has an amino and an oxygen uracil has oxygen oxygen but no methyl here is the base and then add a sugar it becomes nucleoside if you add ribose sugar adenine will become adenosine if you add deoxyribose sugar adenine will become deoxyadenosine this is a nucleoside the first one is an rna the second one is in dna let's make nucleotides then we have adenosine monophosphate adenosine diphosphate adenosine triphosphate in rna or deoxyadenosine monophosphate deoxyadenosine diphosphate deoxyadenosine triphosphate in dna and the story goes on and on and on just remember there is no thymine in rna it's only in DNA. That's why I only wrote deoxythymidine. All of this was discussed in the last video. Pause and review. Your DNA in general is negatively charged. Why? Too much phosphate, and phosphate carries negative charges. Your DNA is made of a bunch of nucleotides, i.e. it's a polynucleotide structure. Between a nucleotide and the next nucleotide, we have covalent bonds, namely 3' prime from the 3' prime of the sugar to 5' prime, the phosphate, phosphodiester bond. 3' prime, 5' prime, phosphodiester covalent bond is the name of the game. This is the link between a nucleotide and the next nucleotide. If you ignore the phosphate, sugar plus base equals nucleoside. The sugar is deoxyribose, missing an oxygen at carbon number two prime. And then the nitrogen space is purines and pyrimidines. Adenine, guanines are purines, but thymine and cytosine are pyrimidine. Your DNA has polarity, five end here, three prime end here. And then the Watson-Crick model, it's anti-parallel, five prime, three prime this way, but five prime, three prime this way. And this is how you read it, five prime to three prime and five prime to three prime anti-parallel the bases are on the inside but the sugar phosphate backbone are to the outside there is complementary base pairing a binds with t and c binds with g the bond between a and t is two hydrogen bonds between g and c however three hydrogen bonds that's why the gc is more stable gc stability that's why later i'll tell you that the primer has high gc content for more stability the centromere has high gc content for stability and the telomeres have high jc content also for stability next shargaff's rule the amount of adenine equals to the amount of thymine in a double-stranded dna molecule similarly the amount of guanine equals the amount of cytosine in a double-stranded DNA molecule. Of course, no kidding, since A binds with T, and since G binds with C, you'll find that they are equal. They did not happen to be equal, they are necessarily equal. Since adenine, which is a purine, is gonna bind thymine, which is a pyrimidine, and since guanine, which is a purine, will bind cytosine, which is a pyrimidine, therefore, if you add the purines together and you add the pyrimidines together, you'll find that they equal each other and they equal 50%. Half of your double-stranded DNA is purines, the other half is pyrimidines. And therefore, just by knowing one of them, we can calculate the percentage of all of the other bases. Don't believe me? Consider this example. If a double-stranded DNA sample has adenine constituting 10% of that sample, how much is the guanine? How much is the thymine? How much is the cytosine? Please pause 
bring a piece of paper and try to do it on your own. Let's do it together. First, start with the known. 15% is the adenine. And as you know, adenine binds with thymine. A binds with T. Therefore, T is also 15%. So far, we have 15% and 15%. Together, they make 30%. How much is left in 100? Answer, 70%. So now I know that G plus C equals 70%. And since G binds with C, therefore you divide the 70 equally among both of them. So you get 35 here and 35 here. Let's add the purines together just to practice. Here is adenine, which is a purine, and guanine, which is purine, which happens to be 15% plus 35%. The purines are 50% which means the pyrimidines are 50%, which means both are equal, and each represents half of the double-stranded DNA sample. Hashtag Shargaf's rule. Let's compare between B DNA and Z DNA. Z stands for zigzag. B DNA is way more common than Z DNA. B DNA is the right-handed double helix, but Z is left. B DNA makes a turn every 3.4 nanometers. How many bases is that distance? About 10 nitrogenous bases. B DNA is stable and therefore easy to research. Most of our knowledge on DNA is about B DNA. Look at that, that's a turn and then another turn, etc. Making major grooves and minor grooves in between. These grooves are important because they provide binding sites to regulatory proteins. Why is Z zigzag? Well, probably due to high salt concentration or high GC content, increasing the chance of zigzagging. This zigzag is very unstable, difficult to research. It makes a turn every 4.6 nanometers and each spans 12 bases. Here is my DNA double strand. If you heat it or put it in an alkaline pH, remember that your cell is normally slightly acidic because cell metabolism releases acids. Or if you put that DNA in urea or in formaldehyde, it will denature, i.e. separate into two separate strands instead of this lovely singular double helix. However, the good news is if you cool that DNA down, well, the bases will join again, and this is called re-annealing, meaning rejoining. Note that when I denatured my DNA, I broke the hydrogen bonds and the covalent bonds. The hydrogen bonds between the bases and the covalent bond between the nucleotides were broken. But in re-annealing, they rejoin again. This technique is used in PCR, especially the rejoining, because you start with a known strand, we call that the probe DNA, and you put in a sample that has gazillion other DNAs. And you're looking for one gene. The gene that sticks, that binds with my DNA, is the gene of concern. The gene that I'm looking for. The unknown will bind to the known because of base pairing. Never ever forget the central dogma. Pause and review. Purines and pyrimidines are heterocycles. Why? Hetero means different. I have nitrogen. I have hydrogen, I have carbon, some of them have oxygen, some of these bases have oxygen, etc. So they are heterocycles, different elements in the ring structure. If you contain more than one element, we call you hetero. If you have a ring, we call you a cycle. Purines and pyrimidines are aromatic, just like the quintessential aromatic molecule benzene. These are cyclical components, they are planar, they are conjugated, joining together of more than one thing and they have a number of pi electrons that can be predicted using this lovely formula which is known as the Huckel rule. We'll talk about this in greater detail later in organic chemistry. But for now just remember your purines and pyrimidines are heterocycles and they are aromatic. Just like Gordon Ramsay. Oh it's aromatic. Wow. F me. To learn more about purine metabolism and how purine degradation will yield uric acid, check out this video called Purine Metabolism. You'll find it in my rheumatology playlist. If you want to learn about kidney physiology, I have a special course about this on my website metacosisperfectsnetis.com. I also have a toxicology course on the same website. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense.